Um, welcome everyone to the communications and journalism panel discussion as a part of Careers Week. We have some really interesting panel members here today who are going to tell us about their career path. Two of them went through Webster and our Webster alums, and, uh, and all four of them have very interesting jobs. And we're going to have them tell us a little bit about themselves, where they, where they, uh, where their path led them to their career, and then we'll discuss some things about just career planning and things that you need to do to prepare yourself. And we'll also touch on uh, the current COVID-influenced uh, uh, career searching issues. And uh, and then after a while, we'll open it up to question. So let's start. We have just uh, let me go through and just uh, tell you who all is on the panel this morning or this afternoon. Angela Baudet, who is a senior art director for Rogers Townsend, which is a, a large agency here in town. And she's also president of the AD2STL. And she's gonna tell us more about what that is in just a few minutes. We also have Derek Gould, and he is a baseball writer for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. And he is, um, he's been writing a lot about baseball lately, I'll bet. And um, this has probably been a challenge for all of the people covering sports, but uh, uh, he's going to join us. He's going to tell us about how he managed to get to that job at the Post-Dispatch. We also have Chris Kubin. Chris is an alumni of uh, the school's graduate program, or actually the PRMA. And he is the founder and managing consultant for Chemistry PR, which is an agency that he has here in town that has done some uh, very uh, interesting and some very um, uh, successful media campaigns for various organizations. He's going to tell us about that in just a minute. And then last but not least, we have Sophie Osier. And Sophie is an alum of the PR program here at Webster. She got a BA in PR a few years ago, I won't say how many, and her path has landed her in Little Rock, Arkansas, where she is the uh, director of group sales and promotions for the Arkansas Travelers Baseball Club, which is a double, is a double A or double A baseball club in Little Rock, and she's going to tell us more about, about that. So thanks so much for all of you joining us this morning, and thanks to all of you out there for your interest in, in listening to our, um, our discussion today. So let's start with Sophie. So Sophie, tell us a little bit about your job and tell us about how you managed to migrate from St. Louis to Little Rock and just give us a quick little idea about what that would be like if you were starting to do that search this year. Yeah, uh, thanks for the introduction, Gary. Um, so as Gary said, I graduated from Webster in 2016. And during my time there, I would say the biggest thing I did is I just tried to take advantage of every possible sports industry related internship or volunteer hours or anything I could get working in the sports industry while I was there. Um, so I did everything from working for Fox Sports Midwest, where we did media stuff and we did marketing events, um, got to uh, work with the Blues for a little bit. And then I went and worked for some independent league baseball teams surrounding St. Louis area where I pulled the tarp and I learned how to tamp a baseball mound. Um, so I did a little bit of everything. I uh, just kind of went into it with the mindset of no job was too good for me. And then shortly after I graduated, went to the baseball winter meetings where they have a huge job and career fair, uh, started interviewing with the Arkansas Travelers, had never heard of the Arkansas Travelers, had never been to Arkansas, knew absolutely nothing about them, um, but interviewed with them. And then shortly after that, got a job as a corporate event planner was what I started out as. Um, so basically was working in group sales. I was selling any sort of events, like if Webster University wanted to bring their students out to the ballpark, that's what I was selling. Um, a year after that, social media kind of got dumped on my plate because they saw I had a background onto public relations and I knew what I was doing. So uh, I've been running social media now for three years, um, took over some stuff with website and email marketing as well. Um, and now I am doing more with promotions. So any giveaways that we do at the ballpark or theme nights. Um, so that's kind of how I got to director of group sales. So if you were gonna start your career today, what do you think the challenge would be? Would you be able to land in the same spot? Um, honestly, no, uh, COVID has thrown a huge curveball pun intended uh, in baseball and sports as a whole and that's honestly what we're all trying to navigate right now is I think the sports and entertainment industry are going to be the last ones to come back from this uh, honestly just because so much of it is about 
getting people in your arena or in your ballpark to experience your product. So it's, it's been some trying times for us, um, but we're, we're just trying to do what's best for our fans, um, what's best for us. So I think we'll get there for sure. And, you know, we're just going to see how this season goes. But um, that being said, trying to find a job in this industry right now is very tough. So um, candidates have to be very, very strong candidates and really be willing to be devoted to this industry, knowing that it may say, take some time to land in this field right now. It might take a couple of years before you can get the job that you want. Um, and you may have to take some internships uh, to be able to get there. Okay. Well, well, we'll, we'll explore that a little bit more in a few minutes. So Angela, Rogers Townsend, tell us about what you do at Rogers Townsend and how you got there and how, what it would be like to try to land a job at Rogers Townsend today. <laughs> Uh, so I'm a senior art director at Rogers Townsend, and I have been there for about five years now. I actually moved to the city to work for Rogers Townsend. Um, I was an intern for about a year and then just kind of stuck with them <laughs> until now. Um, and I really love it. Being an art director for them is challenging and you get to work on so many different things. Um, and I also never expected to move back to St. Louis. I figured when I, I went to school at Northwest Missouri State University over in Maryville, and I had a comprehensive um, advertising degree. I didn't take any art classes, so I knew I had to rely on internships and jobs that I could just get without having an art degree, which worked out in my favor, but it was really hard work trying to make sure and build my portfolio as best as I can. And so then I moved to Kansas City, had an internship there, and then I just cold emailed our HR director here at Rogers Townsend and was fortunate to get an interview and then moved here on a whim to work as another intern. Um, but I really have enjoyed it. I have gotten so many connections because of it. Um, like you mentioned earlier, I'm the president of Add2 STL, which is the 32 and under division of young professionals um, here in St. Louis. So it's every, every facet of promotion. So it can be marketing, can be advertising, can be a production company, um, really anyone that works with commercials or advertising in general, um, it's a club for that. And we, we really like to come together, have virtual events. And um, right now we're trying to give a bit of information of people who are dealing with jobs in COVID. Um, and tomorrow, in fact, there's a, gonna be a virtual event. You guys can join in. Um, you can check on our social, but um, we're going to be giving tips about and talk to people who are currently under 32 and just dealing with how to either find a job, being a freelancer, um, and just trying to navigate right now. Very useful. So yeah, let's uh, do a promo for that before we get finished a little later on. So if you were uh, launching your career this year instead of the year you did, what do you think the outcome would be? Would you be able to land where you are now? Um, I have faith that I probably could, um, it, it would still take a lot of work. You have to make sure your book is pristine, um, because you are going to be working with a lot of people who probably have a lot of time right now to build their book as best as they can. So you're working, you're competing against that level of, um, people, but you also just have to be willing to kind of risk reaching out to people, asking them for a virtual coffee. Um, and a lot of people are kind of nervous to do that, but those are the people that kind of um, have that initiative and really just put themselves out ahead of everybody else. So I think I would be, I would be confident that I could probably still get this job, um, but it's, it would take a lot of work. Okay. Derek, so you're at the Post-Dispatch, you're dealing with baseball and, um, and so tell us a little bit about what you, what your role is there at the Post-Dispatch and um, how you migrated your way to that job and a little bit about what you think the job search would be like if you did it now. Oh, well, only that. Um, yeah, I, uh, I cover the St. Louis Cardinals for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. My title is lead baseball writer or lead Cardinals writer, depending on who you ask. Um, I, uh, I've been at the paper since 2001. I've covered baseball for the paper since 2004. I've gotten to do a little bit of everything um, because I cover baseball for the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. That includes um, being the president of the Writers Association. It means speaking at Cooperstown. It means voting for the Hall of Fame, voting for the MVP, um, to having a chance to cover baseball. And I think it's 
four different countries now. Yeah, four different countries now. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a it's a fascinating job. It's a, a dream job for me, one that I didn't really know was possible until I was in college. Um, I went to the University of Missouri to pursue journalism. It was one of my early fascinations in school. I had a good English teacher who said uh, who pushed me in the direction of journalism. And I had a great English teacher who understood that uh, I had a fondness for baseball as well, and that there was a place where those two things could meet. I went off to Mizzou to, uh, to honestly be a political writer. That's where I thought I was going to go. So I have a poli sci degree and a journalism degree. Um, but during an internship, uh, um, I went down to Florida, worked for a scrappy, hungry, competitive newspaper that rewarded scoops and was really big in trying to take down the Miami Herald and beat the Fort Lauderdale Sun Sentinel. And I got a real taste for the competitiveness of newspapers, um, but also a real sense of, uh, of the reward that you get if you do well doing that. Um, and they gave me a chance to do some sidebars at baseball games. And there it was, I learned, wait a minute, this could be a career. This is something that you, you could do even do at a young age. Um, if you, if you, worked in the right places or pushed in the right direction. I'm out of college. I got a job in New Orleans. I worked at the Thomas Pickian for three and a half years, then went to the Rocky Mountain News, which was in Denver. That's a paper that no longer exists, sadly. It's also the paper I grew up reading um, because I grew up in Colorado and had a great nine months there. Um, Married a girl from St. Louis who insisted we come back. And so here here I am. Uh, came back, covered uh, the Blues for three years, um, but always chased baseball. Always, always wanted to. If this job was going to require the hours that it required to do something that I'm passionate about, and I'm lucky enough to cover baseball in a baseball town, uh, and all that goes with it. And you'll you'll probably see me during the course of this glance down at my phone. You probably already have because I'm dealing with news and text messages and trying to set up interviews. And that's just the nature of the job. So um, you can see how difficult I am to be a friend with because I'll often be distracted by the buzz of my phone and stuff. So uh, um, as far as searching for a job now, um, it's upside down. Um, you know, the way, you know, date myself here. I mean, I graduated in 1997 and the things expected of this job now are they're galactically different than when I graduated in 97. The things that I was taught to do at Mizzou um, were a great bedrock, um, but I have to do a lot more. I mean, I came out of Mizzou like a utensil, a, a fork or a spoon or a knife. Um, and now the job requires me to be a Swiss army knife. And I gotta be a fork and a spoon and a knife and a toothpick and a whatever a bottle opener. I mean, it's just, this, these, this is the way it's gone. Um, so I think applying for a job now um, I would personally be more equipped to do it, um, but I also might be now too old to do it because it is catering towards younger people. Um, the beat, the baseball beat, the sports beat is genuinely skewing much younger today than it did when I was coming out of college. And that's a great thing for, for young journalists, um, but it's also a daunting thing because they, they want young people because of the hours that they expect you to work. Good. Well, thank you. And I'm glad, you know, it's always, it's always gratifying to hear someone say they're doing something that they would, that they love to do. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, you know, that's oftentimes that's not always available, but it's, it's a wonderful to hear that. So Chris, Chris Kuban, Chris was a student of mine in the graduate program, low those many years ago. And now he's a big time PR person who's done a lot of things for national uh, media attention so Chris, tell us about what you're doing and how you got there and what do you think about um, trying to do that now in the midst of a pandemic? Well, first I have to say that I think um, all of us that are communicators or uh, in the communications field at one point realized that they absolutely love this field or something about the field has drawn them to what they do. And as long as you love what you do, you're really drawn to it. I mean, back in high school, I was the editor of my high school newspaper and ended up, uh, I got into politics and had a, a uh, uh, fell in love with it. In fact, my mentor at the time was uh, Chris Sifford, who was one of the, he was the, uh, the press secretary for Governor Carnahan, who died in the plane crash with Governor Carnahan in 1999. So 
Um, I, I got a real lucky break when I uh, went to the first event in St. Louis in 1992 for Bill Clinton, um, shot some photos, jumped on top of a newspaper stand, met him and said, my name is Chris. I'm going to vote for you in October. And uh, he basically said, I'd be honored to have your vote. And the next day I took my photos to the campaign headquarters and they hired me as the Missouri staff photographer. So this was a good, what, 28 years ago. And to be 17 and a half years old and have Secret Service clearance to everything that happened in Missouri, to be riding in the same motorcade as the president or vice president or going to national conventions. I actually ran for office myself in 1998. And I always say the best thing that ever happened to me was that I lost. I then, as a serial entrepreneur, I actually started a tech company that now looking back in 1998, we were doing the exact same thing that Amazon was doing at that time. We just didn't get funded. So um, went from, I guess, finishing my master's degree at Webster uh, to moving out to Los Angeles and doing communications out there. I've lived in LA, I've lived in New York, got married in Los Angeles, moved back to St. Louis, uh, went to work for a marketing firm. And in 2007, um, two th well, actually 2008, 2009, everything crashed. And I think I'm gonna jump the gun before I tell you the rest of my story and say, look, I mean, I graduated with my master's degree in 2000. We've had three major recessions since then. We had 9-11, we had 2007, 2008, and we've had COVID now. And I think what makes us professionals is how we really uh, pick ourselves up and move on to the next project, find the next client, find that next job, be persistent, be patient, but promote yourself. And I, I think after I lost my job, in marketing in 2009, I'm not one to sit and twiddle my thumbs. I'm one that will go out and, and, and make myself known. And I sent out about 2,000 resumes and couldn't get anyone to hire me. So I'm like, I'm going to start my own company. So in 2009, I started Chemistry, PR, and Multimedia um, as just a small solo practitioner. I was going to go out and get small clients and put food on the table. And that's what I was doing was uh, one of my small clients happened to be the St. Louis City Firefighters, and uh, I had some other clients. I ended up getting a, a 2020 and Nightline segment for that were writers uh, or authors in Crestwood. And the firefighters, though, ironically, in late 2010, I got sent to a meeting. Now, I wasn't making a whole lot of money with them, but this meeting I got sent to was the FDNY sent their people to St. Louis and actor Gary Sinise to do a benefit concert for the second survivor who lost both his arms and both his legs at war. They wanted to do a benefit concert with the Lieutenant Dan Band and um, ends up at the end of that first meeting, they said, Chris, you're in charge of the concert. Like I'd never produced a concert before and ends up everything went great. We raised a quarter million dollars, but everything from the PR to the interviews to the events that we did, we raised a quarter million dollars to help build this house for Todd, Corporal Todd Nicely. And from that event here in St. Louis, they kept asking me to do more and more and more. And uh, 26 concerts later and 26 different uh, media markets. And I, I mean, I ended up doing all the groundbreakings, the dedication ceremonies, the, the walls of honor in markets all over the country. And you see the video gear behind us. About eight years ago, we learned very easily that um, media is not gonna travel. 45 minutes, an hour and a half to get a story. So you really have to put that story on a silver platter. And if that means you have to shoot it yourself, you have to edit it yourself, you have to provide the B-roll or the content and then get it to the news outlet, 99% of all the news outlets in the, in the country would use our footage, except for St. Louis. And the only reason why they wouldn't use it in St. Louis was because um, of the union rules and regulations here. And that has since changed a lot, but we got into video production and I think your question, I mean, now we've expanded. We bought a building last year. We have a studio, a video studio in house, a recording and podcasting studio. And we've really pivoted from media relations and PR to mostly video production for all of our clients. And we've won some pretty big contracts. We're doing uh, projects for Papa John's, the uh, franchisee group. We we're doing uh, a, college commencement ceremonies we're doing, we're bidding out 864 videos right now on another project. So um, I have videographers in LA and New York and um, here in St. Louis. So it's really a story of kind of be persistent, um, but be patient. I mean, for five months this year, all of our, our, all of our events stopped when, we, when COVID hit. 
And we had to kind of retool and figure out how we were going to move forward and get new clients and survive. And we're now at a position to where we're ready to explode going into 2021. And I have the capabilities of potentially hiring up to 30 employees next year. So um, I don't know if I answered all your questions, Gary, but- You did. Yeah, and we'll get a chance to expand on some of those in a little while. And uh, now let's see. So all the students out there know that we have professional development activities for all of our degree programs. And they range from internships to uh, portfolio review. We have some other activities and all that. And in uh, and among all of our classes, we emphasize networking. It's all about networking. It's all about knowing people and getting most of the jobs are gotten by who you know and how you do that. But Networking is always a challenge for students. And for some reason, uh, I've had students just, to, they just didn't like to go to professional meetings because they'd have to talk to people. That would be terrible. And uh, it, that was a big enough challenge in a normal time. But now with COVID, it seems to me like networking and building a network of contacts is a big, big challenge. So I wanna throw this out on behalf of the students who may be sitting there thinking, oh my God, how am I gonna do this if I graduate in May? And so I'd like to ask you, what recommendations would you have for students to build a network right now in the midst of this? Uh, any of you, just, just throw out an answer. What do you think? I would say I can jump in real quick on that. Um, sure. I, again, being an ad too, that's exactly how I got connected with everybody. I'm, Rogers Townsend is pretty connected with a lot of the agencies already, but that's how I got connected with so many individuals in St. Louis um, was was joining ad too, um, which we do have a whole section of students, which we I highly recommend everybody joining or if like finding one that's closer to what your degree is. So AIGA um, or um, and like any, the marketing association, anything that kind of those clubs, um, a lot of them right now are having virtual events, which is a very easy way to kind of, you don't have to show up to an event and feel awkward. Um, a lot of them are having virtual trivia nights or just easy ways to kind of break the ice. Um, and those are just great ways to kind of get your foot in the door and start those conversations. So that way you then can ask people to have a virtual coffee or to kind of start um, building that network a little bit more, but joining any of these like virtual events that are happening for local clubs is probably one of the easiest ways, in my opinion, of just breaking that ice and starting building that network. Chris, what do you think? So I would go a little bit further than Angela did. And uh, I'm also the president of the Public Relations Society of America here in St. Louis. And um, this week we are actually producing our 25th webinar um, in the last six months. So that's almost one webinar every single week for the last um, six months. And those webinars are free for members and non-members. So I do encourage you to, um, to join a professional organization and get actively involved. And what I mean by that is you can go to events and you can go and meet people and every organization out there, whether it's professional or it's a club, have their own little clicks. I am suggesting get involved by making a decision to be on the board, be on a committee, get involved. And those are the people that really get the benefit of meeting other people and engaging in them. I can tell you probably in the last three years, I have worked on probably six proposals with people that I met within the Public Relations Society of America. And that's a great way to, to network with people get involved and to reach out to people, whether it be on LinkedIn or um, uh, Facebook or other social media, reach out to people, introduce yourself. Eric, what do you think? Is there opportunities to network in journalism now? Or Ab Absolutely, yeah. I can, uh, I can speak a little bit from my own experience, which I think is still applicable. When I was a senior at, at Mizzou and I was applying for jobs, I sent out 68 applications. You know, they, these weren't emails, these were like stacks of clips and everything like that. And I, uh, I think I got 68 rejections. Um, however, I got a job offer from a place that I did not apply because one of the people that rejected me passed my application to another sports editor. 
who passed it to another sports editor who had a job open. And so it was a network that I didn't even know of, but at least I got into because I had basically been Johnny Appleseed with my applications, trying to plant them all over the place to see if any took root. Um, I think that still is in play. It's just cheaper nowadays because you can send an email. Um, I didn't have to, I had to send packages and Xerox and lots of money spent at Kinko's. My parents were not thrilled, um, you know, but that, that, that still is in play today um, because the more people you reach out to, the more they might put you in contact with people who have jobs open. I'll also say that like in my realm of the sports communication, you don't need a job to write. You, you should get paid if you write, but you don't need a job to write. And so as you apply and as you get to know people, don't lose the notion that like, okay, you could start a blog or you could work freelance or you could start trying to make applications um, in that nation, like lo- notion, like say you apply to the post dispatch and they don't have a job open. That doesn't mean they don't have stories for you to do. Um, find the freelance edge, start pitching stories to magazines or anything. If you want to cover sports, find the magazine and make a, a pitch to them because especially nowadays they may not want or have room for a staff, but they always have room for content and there's infinite amount of space on the web. So just because I would not, I would maybe parcel the time out a little bit where it's not just a hundred percent applying for jobs or a hundred percent networking. It's also part of that is also working for different places and writing because you don't have to have a title or a full-time job to do that, but it can lead to one. Right. Sophie, is anybody networking in Little Rock? <laughs> yeah. Well, I actually received some really good advice while I was at Webster. And um, I always thought networking events were very daunting and sounded very scary as a college student. Um, but they always told me if you can go to a networking event and make one good connection, then that's a success. And I think sometimes as college students, we think we need to go and meet as many people as possible. And you don't, if you go and you build one quality relationship with one person, that person can help you down the line. So I think that's a a better way of looking at it. But um, I actually have a similar story to Derek. Um, When I was in college, I just started looking up all sorts of people that worked in minor league baseball, major league baseball, just had jobs that I wanted. I read their job descriptions. I was like, man, I really want that job. And I just emailed them. I sent them my resume. I said, Hey, I don't know if you need help with anything. I don't know if you have any internships available, but I would love to either talk to you or if you have any positions available, I would love to hear some more information about that. And I don't think I got a single email back from anybody, but fast forward to this year, I got the opportunity to go to the winter meetings with my assistant general manager and general manager. I actually met a guy that I emailed back in 2014 or whenever I was a junior in college. Um, and I recognized his photo from the website where I got it from when I emailed him back in 2014. I was like, man, I'm pretty sure I emailed this guy. And so I went back through my emails and I found the email and I was sitting there having this conversation with him and I joked with my general manager manager sitting next to me I said man I emailed this guy back in like 2014 asking if I could get a job well my general manager knew him really well so he brought it up and he was like hey you ignored her email in 2014 when she asked you and then I felt so awkward and this guy he handled it so well he's like I'm so sorry like I'm usually really good at responding to people and I didn't but I'm so glad that you made it and like you got a job in this industry um so, I mean, just shoot those emails out to everybody. You might get rejected by everybody, but at least it's good experience to put yourself out there and get practice, you know, uh, selling yourself. So I would say that's probably my best advice. That was a good story too. <laughs> you never know. I keep telling students, if you sit next to someone and crank up a conversation and give them a card, they may not have any idea they'll ever hire you, but someone may call them and say, do you know someone that's available? So, oh yeah, I sat next to Sophie. She was really interesting. Here, let me give you her card. Next thing you know, you've got an interview. And um, so speaking of interviews, and now that you've networked, uh, I don't know if any of you have conducted any interviews since we've been in lockdown. I would be interested to know if you've either either conducted an interview or or participated in an interview for a job since we've been in this situation. Has anyone? I wonder what that's like. What what kind of a different situation would you be in if you're sitting in front of a Zoom camera trying to impress somebody? Anyone? No? Any advice? Can you imagine what that might be like? Do you have any advice for students that might be facing that situation? 
Well, I, I think number one is you have to make sure you have good lighting. You have to make sure you're dressed appropriately. All the simple stuff. You want to make sure that you're head on to the camera. Uh, I mean, that is normal stuff that no matter if you're on a Zoom class or Zoom for class, I mean, you never know who you're meeting on all of these Zoom calls that you can interact with down the road. So be as professional as you possibly can. And I, I think whatever you do in life, job-wise, your credibility and your reputation and your ethics are always what guides your principle. If you lose or do something stupid, and we've all done something stupid, it's just mine was back when there wasn't camera, everyone had cameras, but that can follow you for the rest of your life. So I encourage you to, uh, obviously, when you're doing events, don't drink at those events until after the event is over with. I mean, these are simple things, as if you're at a networking event where there's alcohol. I, I mean, be sure that you temper yourself and you're professional and you're not overdoing it. And I think that creates a stigma with some people if they do overdo it. Yeah, I'll also say too, like from at least from a portfolio review portion of it, um, it's almost a little easier when you're trying to present your portfolio via Zoom because sometimes you need to bring in a tablet, you need to bring in a laptop, you have to have a device of some sort to present your work, or you have to have a printed book. And sometimes you don't have a printed book at all. And so you're kind of scrambling on how to show your work in the best light. And when you're on Zoom, you can kind of navigate that. You can take it straight to your website and kind of go through your work. You can have a presented book um, and you're sharing the screen. So it makes it almost a little bit easier in my opinion to kind of just showcase your work. Um, but however, whatever your book looks like, I think the most important thing too is just making sure your personality shows. Um, a lot of times some people can kind of get really nervous um, on Zoom calls because they don't know how to, because they're just talking to a screen essentially. And so just making sure you're still bringing forth your personality and showing people, yes, you have all of the skills that make you a good hire, but here's my personality and why I would be actually a great fit for your um, company. So. So would you recommend then practicing, uh, uh, you know, the whole Zoom thing, most of the time people who spend hours and hours on Zoom in classes, they're the, they're are the, uh, they're the victim, so to speak. They're the audience, but developing skills that, that allow you to talk to a camera are always a difficult thing, even for people that are going into that business. But what kind of things do you think you could do that would help you develop those skills um, on your own? Does any have any ideas? Angela, I know you, you, you hit on some really, really good advice there. Yeah, I would say practice and never hurts. Um, you don't want to obviously sound too rehearsed, but you do want to make sure that you feel comfortable in front of a screen. So if you're using, hand, I'm talking with my hands, even though you, none of you can see that. So like talk how you would and just present um, just so it feels naturally. You don't want to be like sitting straight, like, and feel like a robot presenting because that's not how you would act in person. So it's very much keeping it conversational and in practice, make sure you have a good Wi-Fi connection or at least you're plugged into the internet. So that way, if you are presenting your book or something, you don't lose that connection and nothing is kind of spotty, but yeah, run through it a few times, make sure like you're good to go um, with how you want to be presented. And I, I feel like that's about all you, can do and sort of prepping uh, other than like making sure you are like in screen and the lighting is good and all of that but you just have to kind of practice talking in front of screen if you're not used to it i would just recommend recording yourself to be honest pull out an iphone stand in front of it press record and talk and that way it's just you and you get through your you know you get what you're comfortable with you get to learn to make eye contact with the camera and not the picture of yourself um, you get to learn to how you articulate and also there's just no pressure of a deadline and then there's a recording that you can watch yourself um, that was one of the keys when when I had to make the well I mean I was a print guy through and through um, had no no tv experience had never been on tv anything and then long about 04 2004 got thrust into being on tv quite a lot and I had to learn how to do it um, my my wife uh worked in TV here. So I had a little bit of an, well, no, a lot of an in, and I had a lot of great advice from her. But one of the things that she, uh, she had me do was stand in or sit in front of a camera and talk to the camera. And then I got an earpiece and she would just talk nonsense into the earpiece as I had to get through what I was saying. 
just to get practice doing that. And I am talking with my hands too, which you can see. Um, but you know, just, just having some feedback because then I could watch it and I could see, Oh, that eternity that it felt like I wasn't talking was a second and that's not so bad. And you can pause and you can do all those things. So you need a recording of that to understand what you look like. Um, especially cause zoom is so transactional, um, where it's me talk, you talk, me talk, you talk. It's not very conversational. Um, that you have to get comfortable with the cadence of how you look in that so that there's not awkward pauses and there's not, um, you get a feel for what a real length of a pause is. So Gary, could I interject? We've got sure. a couple of questions that are really uh, revolving around this social anxiety, this how to start a conversation. Well, so, let's put, let's have one. Yeah, our, pa our panelists are really hitting on that really well for our students. They feel uh, socially, uh, some social anxiety uh, about, um, you know, making good connections. And this is all, you know, under the umbrella of networking and feeling awkward and not wanting to sound too pushy on Zoom or LinkedIn mm -hmm. uh, opportunities. Uh, they, they're talking, they, they never know how to start that conversation. What do you talk about? So you've hit on a lot of that panelists, but maybe another couple of pointers about that process. You and know. Um, yeah, and those of you out there who have specific questions for specific panelists, throw those into the, into the mix too. We'll come back to them in just a few minutes. But um, yeah, to that point, um, what kinds of, what would be the most uh, positive thing I, you can think of that uh, helped you find the job that you have right now. I mean, if we, you know, I think, I think a lot of times students are overwhelmed as, as Susan was mentioning, they're overwhelmed with the idea that they're at a, they're at a milestone in their life where one thing's gonna end and something else is gonna begin and the responsibility for what that future looks like is entirely on them. And I think, do you have any advice that would help them feel better about being so concerned, you know, that, that, that they get become a little uh, too, too uh, paralyzed with that. Is there anything that you can assure them about? Um, so kind of to piggyback about what everybody else was talking about with doing Zoom interviews, and I think this also carries over to networking too. I always would write out a set of just four or five standard questions that I could ask anybody. Um, that is a good practice for doing an in-person interview as well as a Zoom interview, but it helps loosen things up a little bit. It helps your personality shine through because a lot of times the interviewer will then ask you that same question back. Um, but I would always just write down if I was about to go into like a chamber event, which I mean, I still go to chamber events and I get very nervous. Um, so I still do this to this day is write down three or four questions, whether it's just, it could be something about their family or about their personal life or what they like to do in their spare time. Um, but just standard questions that if the conversation gets awkward, or if you don't know what to say, you can ask them, you know, you can always ask somebody, what is your favorite thing and your least favorite thing about your job? Or if you're interviewing for a position say hey what have people done in this role well and what have people done in this role not well um, just standard questions that you can always fall back on when you get nervous because you will get nervous so those always kind of helped me Gary, 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 yeah Derek Gary to your question about like uh, like word of advice and I'm trying to not oversimplify this example but I think we all you know in schools and everything like that we all know the folks who are good test takers and then there are like good in the classroom, right? Not everybody who is great in the classroom is good at taking a test, whether it's because of anxiety or because of the clock or whatever. Um, but that doesn't mean that the person who's not good at the test doesn't know the subject matter because they're aces in the classroom. And I, I think there's something parallel there with jobs, right? Like an interview might be the test. And it's your classwork, though, that determines how good you are at your job. And so I would draw confidence from that, draw confidence from all the work you've put in to create, whether it's a portfolio or whether it's clips or whether it's a, a you know, video or whether it's a resume or anything like that, that's the bedrock of your confidence. And then the better, the, the way you get better at tests is by practice. And if, you know, look, I had a terrible interview at the Post-Dispatch, I'll be honest, it did not go well. I walked out of it early at one point because I was uncomfortable with it and I still got the job. 
I didn't get the job because of how captivating and charismatic I was in the interview. I got the job offer because my work and the reason why I was uncomfortable in the interview stood out for the type of journalist I was. And that was beneficial to me. It was not something I would recommend doing, um, but I had the confidence because I had put in the work that even if the test went a little wonky, I could still rely on the work as my representative representative. So anybody else thoughts on what the best advice might be, Chris, you said something. Yeah, I think a lot of what everyone said is watch your crutch words too. When you're interacting with someone, we used to talk to each other or give speeches in front of, of a mirror. Uh, and Toastmasters actually was the best thing for me. They had something called table topics to where they would have someone at the front podium uh, talking about any subject, and then they call on your name, and you have to talk for two minutes on that subject, and you might not know anything about that subject. And every time you said a crutch word, they someone rang a bell. And subconsciously, in my mind, when I did that 20 years ago, I learned a pause is okay. You don't have to continue your conversation, and you can pause and let the other person it might seem awkward but let the other person have some say as well listen to them more so than you're trying to pitch yourself ask questions of them mm -hmm. I, I mean you're, you're trying to pitch yourself but the more you engage and ask them about themselves they're going to feel more important and they're going to want to engage back with you okay so we've talked about um, the interviewing process the fact that portfolios in this in this world and maybe going forward we don't know uh, are mostly electronic and uh, and you can really do a better job of presenting those portfolios if you if you do the work ahead of time we have made the point that that your work is as much what sells you as the fact that you do an interview you want to do a good interview but a good interview won't be a substitute for bad work and uh, good work could be a substitute for a bad interview or one that may, may uh, not be up to what you would like. We talked about the value of networking and the, and the ability of you to be able to develop a network with a little more work uh, in the time of a, of a COVID uh, situation. So now let's talk a little bit about the tools, the things that are available to, to students and new, uh, and new job seekers that will help them. I know we've got a couple of people here that represent professional associations here in St. Louis. And uh, so talk to us a little bit about the value of being a part of a professional association, whether it's a journalism association or a marketing or, or advertising organization or an organization for, for uh, nonprofits. Or, or for public relations? What kind of benefits do those organizations provide, provide students that they can use as a springboard? Let's start with the president of the PRSA. Well, I belong to many different groups. I mean, whether it's the Unified Strategies Public Relations Council or uh, the solo PR practitioners or solo PR pros or uh, Counselors Academy, which is an organization of agency owners from solo practitioners, virtual agencies to agencies that have 400 employees. So there's a lot of benefit you get out of it. I'll guarantee you, you nor I know every single answer that's going to be posed to you. And through a professional organization, I ask almost weekly questions on how I should run my business, how to interact with problem clients, how to get over a major crisis scenario or pointers. Um, belonging to an organization is where you go to ask questions and to seek counsel to help you through scenarios that you're, you're currently working in. So they're a great professional organization to learn things such as the webinars or the networking of going face to face, but more so for yourself, it's I think peace of mind for me that I have met so many amazing people through this process over the last four years. And uh, let's see, uh, Angela, what about your organization? What do you think? Um, I think one of the biggest things is networking. Um, like everyone has already <laughs> known or said, um, you get a job from who you know, really. That's kind of what it comes down to. And I have met so many incredible people as well. But I also think too with um, webinars or we have these ad club connected where ad club connected chats, which are like panels of just different parts of the industry, you get a bigger understanding of what's happening 
with like outside of your little bubble. So I am in creative, so I do art direction and design, but I understand too about um, social media strategy and um, how the account sides work because I go to those events and it just helps you get a rounded education on just what's happening in your industry. And I think that's really important, especially since advertising is changing pretty much every single day, it seems. So um, it's, it's great to go to events and have a community where you can kind of come together and learn about that. Um, but also again, just networking, it's probably the biggest, biggest thing. Good. Okay. So we've, uh, we've kind of given us uh, some good advice. So now we've got, let's turn to some questions and we've got a question here for Angela and we've got one here for Derek. Those of you who are out there in the, uh, in the audience, please submit a question. Uh, if you have a question for a specific person, just tap it into the Q and A and we'll try to get time to it. So, uh, individual panelists, as I give you these questions, just give us a short answer if you would. Angela, it says here, how do you know you want to get, you wanted to get into art when you didn't take art classes in college? What kinds of things are in your portfolio? Uh, so when I was a child, I loved design. I like made dresses out of bed sheets. I would build with Legos. Like I loved making things. And so I always knew I liked art, but I didn't think it was going to be a viable career choice. Um, so when I was in high school, I took a marketing class. And then when I got to college, I was like, I'm going to major in marketing. This is what I want to do. And I took a, a single promotions class. And I was like, I love advertising. So I switched my freshman year to advertising after like a week because I was that sold on the career. Um, and then I took some, I took an art class. Like I took a drawing class and a typography class. And those are the only two art classes I've ever taken because I discovered um, that I would have to take two more years of college if I wanted to switch my degree. And I was told by all of my, all of my advisors and people I just was connected with outside of my university that it didn't really matter what your degree was as long as your book um, and your skills were really great, then it didn't matter what your degree was. And so I just kind of took that to heart um, and I got internships. I was on the, I was a graphic artist manager for our student media department. And then I just kept trying to build my portfolio as much as I possibly could um, to make sure I could get a job <laughs> in a field that I wanted. And it really worked out. Um, again, as, as long as your book is good and it's not just, it looks pretty because that's just surface level. You have to have good work that the strategy is also there, which is really important, which is why I'm thankful that I have an advertising degree because I do understand the psychology of consumer behavior and what my why my work looks a specific way um, but it also is just it also happens to be beautiful so it's a what it's a more rounded look at advertising which I think is very important good so Derek we've got a question here from a sophomore who is a journalism major and he's interested in he or she I can't tell who he or she is interested in sports writing so what do you believe would be the best internship in St. Louis, which will give me the best experience in writing about sports? Well, uh, that's a great question. I, I don't know of a specific internship off the top of my head. Um, the, the local writer of the, or the local chapter of the baseball writers, we run an internship um, through Mizzou um, for, for a journalism student there that allows them to come work with us and the, the baseball writers actually pay that. However, there are internships at the Post-Dispatch, and I know that the baseball writers work with the Society of Professional Journalists, which is spj.org, um, as far as either you know, scholarships or awards or things like that to help fund parts of internships. So um, I think you know, it, there is a lot of, there's a lot of writing to be done out there in St. Louis. So if you want to stay in St. Louis, uh, I can't think of like one internship but I think one, one way to go about it is to contact any media outlet that has a website. So don't limit it to the Post-Dispatch um, in the sense that you also have the TV stations and the radio stations that have websites and they need written content there too. So I would go that route. Um, so spj.org or reach out to the Post-Dispatch to see about their internships. Um, our newsroom coordinator, if you, if you have a contact us there at the sdltoday.com. Um, you know, there, there are different out, um, different opportunities there as well, but we're not just limited to the notion of one specific internship, rather look to places that are out for content. Okay. We got another question here. Before I go to that, there are hundreds of you out there in the audience. And so surely we've got more questions. 
If you've got something that you'd like to find out from one of these folks who are here, especially for you today, please just type it into the Q&A and we'll get right to it. So um, what do you think are the most underappreciated and needed skills for an aspiring communications professional and, be and the best way to hone those skills while you're a college student? What are the underappreciated skills? Chris has got a, sm a smile on his face with an answer. Well, before I get into that, I'll also throw out that the uh, St. Louis Press Club, I think, does a couple internships per semester. Do. So that's that right. is an option for, for students as well. And I, I think there's several underutilized skills. I, I think one is being able to tell a story. So good storytelling and being understanding what is a good story or what is going to motivate or move somebody to, to get involved or to raise their hand and, and, and say, I want to do something. Um, another thing is being a jack of all trades is understanding that communication is changing is you can't just only be a writer. You have to be a, an, you have to write ad content. You have to be able to do images or you, there's a whole host of if you're a jack of all trades and know how to pull into a team, that is really, I, I think, important. And just really building relationships with people is knowing that if someone's going to come to you, whether it's for a story or that you're credible in what you do and what you say, and if you ever ruin that, you're never going to be called again. Other thoughts? Underappreciated skills? Talents? Sophie's yeah, smiling. Um <laughs> um, just to kind of piggyback off of what Chris said is not only being a jack of all trades, but being willing to do that. Um, I think it, while I was in college, you know, I was taking journalism classes and I was learning InDesign and Illustrator and those were kind of coming on the scene right when I was in college. And so then when I got this job, you know, I got here and nobody knew how to use InDesign or Illustrator or Photoshop. So that's kind of how I got thrown at social media because nobody knew how to do that. Um, the willingness to learn how to do video editing. I mean, back in my day, you used to have to learn Final Cut Pro, but now, I mean, you can edit a, and shoot a video on your iPhone. Um, so it's just the willingness to be able to do all of that and to go even further outside of communication skills. Mine is just, we work at a, for a small team, for a small baseball facility. So I got to go outside and move picnic tables sometimes. And sometimes I need to go out and tarp the field. And sometimes I need to go help them physically wipe down counters and clean concession stands or flip burgers. I, I mean, you literally need to be able to do anything and the willingness to be able to do it. I think that's probably the number one trait I look for when we're hiring people is they can't be too good to do anything. They need to be able and willing to do anything that's best for the team. One of our students has asked, well, how do you um, introduce yourself on a Zoom call without feeling awkward or pushy? Um, and uh, they did not specify what the context of that would be, but I'm wondering, um, apparently they feel like a, a one-way thing in Zoom is more awkward than face-to-face. -face. Any advice on that? We're stuck with Zoom at this point. So until there's a vaccine that everyone can go out and go to networking events, this is what we're doing. So reach out to people, use Calendly or a scheduling event that works with your calendar that will automatically create Zoom meetings um, at a certain time with people. It's use the automation to allow other people to, to choose a time that works best with you and them, is giving them that, that opportunity to do so. I would also say the practice thing. Um, if you feel a little bit awkward on video chats, just call family members, call friends, um, just get used to kind of having those conversations virtually because again, like Chris said, we're, we're stuck with this for a while. So might as well um, do a little bit of practicing because the more you do it, the more comfortable you're going to be talking to a, a screen. So. so we've had a question here about social media. And the question is, how can social media platforms other than LinkedIn uh, help in finding jobs? Um, they're saying like Facebook groups or specific job listing websites and those kinds of things. Um, is social media positive or is it a negative? I actually found my, I got my job from responding to a tweet from my company. They had posted an article on Twitter and I just emailed them and I was like, this article was really great. Um, would love to talk, here's my portfolio. And then that's how they contacted me back because I was paying attention to their social channels. 
Um, so if there's a company you're really passionate about, pay attention to what they're posting on not just LinkedIn, but on Twitter, maybe they're having an Instagram and something looks really cool, DM them. Um, right now, DMing people on social is kind of a norm at this point. So I wouldn't be afraid to do that. Sometimes that's a little, it's a casual way for kind of people to get to know you. And especially somebody as a visual person, my entire um, like Instagram, it has to be public at this point. I mean, you can have a private one, but that's where I'm also showcasing my art as well. And so different ways to kind of showcase your different skills can be maybe you are you write articles and you post them on Twitter. That's a cool way to kind of bring people into an extra skill set that you have. So just using your platforms wherever you can to kind of enhance who you are and what you can offer to a company. So you've got a public and a private Facebook page that you use both? Um, I don't have a public Facebook page just because that's for all of my family members. <laughs> right. But, um, but I would say like my Twitter and my um, Instagram are and, and LinkedIn, because those are platforms that I am also using as my, for my career as well. And so if, I would say if you're going to have anything public, treat it like it, you would a job almost. Um, don't be, I would don't post anything profane, like keep it um, <laughs> pretty good for in case an employer does see it. Um, it's okay to have platforms on every channel. That's totally fine. But just make sure if you are keeping it public or private, um, your public ones are good to go. <laughs> yeah. Any other thoughts from others? There are, uh, on, on Twitter, there, there's pretty good listings for jobs in, in my world of sports writing and also in journalism. There are different um, sites, APSE, which is a sports editors association. Um, the 30 um, is another group. And on Twitter, if they hear about a job open, they're likely to put the job listing there. Or one way to do it is to watch the jobs that people are taking, because that means they're leaving one. Um, that was something that uh, they taught me when I was in school, was always pay attention to the people who are getting promotions or moving to other beats, because they're likely leaving one open. And uh, look there, make a phone call, because the worst that can happen is they can say, no, we already have somebody for that, but that might be a good way to find out. And so. You can watch different job listings there uh, on Twitter. Um, your question, Gary, was, is social media good or bad? The answer is both. Um, it can be very good to make connections. I have friends that I would not have met through any other way than through social media. Um, but I would caution the notion of a private um, page. Only so much is private, even on a private social media channel. Um, you know, there are... You know, if you have, uh, if you can curate your Twitter privately as much as you want, but it only takes a screenshot to change um, what, it, what goes public. And so always keep that in mind um, as you go through it, because employers are more and more going to check whatever they can to find out more about you. Right. So Gary, I'd like to add something else too, because I, I think Derek can probably agree to this, is as a publicist or a public relations professional, we are always pitching people that we've never met. We are always talking to people and talking stories and pitching them. I mean, Ed Rich here in St. Louis, who was the news director, not news director, he was the uh, KSDK assignment desk editor or Terry Cancillo or a number of others. I can tell you for 10 years, I've never met them, but they know my voice when I talk to them on the phone. So it's not necessarily different that we're in a pandemic. It's that we've always used a different medium. So whether it's picking up the phone and calling someone or using Zoom or an email, it, it's you're still reaching out to someone that you haven't made a relationship with. And by doing that, you build the relationship. A couple of you mentioned earlier that uh, one of the ways that you could get noticed is to pitch uh, work or, or do freelance work and pitch stories. And the question is, uh, how do you do that? What kind of, um, what kind of uh, methods do you use? What that process looks like? and how a person could get their work or campaign or, um, or story noticed uh, without their being known, without them being known? Well, it starts with the email you send or the phone call that you make. So if you want to write, if you want to submit a story and you want to write an email to pitch that story, don't have the email littered with grammar errors or poor punctuation, because that's the first thing that they're going to read. Um, so it starts there. It starts with the entry point. Um, but it also um, 
you know, starts with an interest. So those two things, it, it starts with taking the one step to either make the phone call or submit the email, but it also starts with curiosity and an interest in what can you do and an understanding that they may not accept this, you, you know, this proposal, but ask them how to get the next proposal or what else is there to do. Um, that is increasingly true in the newspaper business or really in the journalism business, because again, everybody's hungry for content and they want, but they have an idea as to what direction they want that content to go. And if you're necessary, if your proposal doesn't necessarily fit that content, ask what would. Um, so it's really those elements. It's that first step, whether it's a phone call or an email, make sure it's crisp and clean and succinct and to the point. Um, it doesn't, you don't have to necessarily impress with it. You're not, you're not doing a Broadway show. You just start getting to the point um, of what you want to offer. Then two, the curiosity. And then three, work ethic would be the good way to put it, but persistence also helps. So your diligence to keep up with that, like, well, what else can I do? What else can I do? Um, you know, okay, you have one story for me to do. Cool, I'm going to do that. Can I turn that into five next week? How do I do that? Uh, and always try to expand the amount, show them that you're willing to expand the amount of time you're willing to give them. Yeah, I will, I will say from a side or even a work perspective, um, shared on social. Um, it's a little different from because you're not pitching a story, you're pitching your own work. And so it's just trying to get it out there as much as you can. So lean into SEO hashtags, start using all the hashtags that you can think of that people would be searching, that they could find your work. Um, use sites like Behance or Cargo Collective or um, even Pinterest, like start using and sharing your platforms as much as you can. I created a pro bono campaign and I just started by creating an Instagram channel. And then I just shared it to everybody that I knew. And then that developed in creating different connections with like a t-shirt company, um, with creating with a charity. Like it, it opened a lot of doors because then all of these people had been exposed to it and they could help me get connections that I needed to and help grow it even further. So I would, yeah, lean into hashtags because it's an underrated thing that a lot of people probably don't even think about when they're sharing their work, um, but it can be very beneficial. Okay. We got a question. There are a lot of oh, sorry. No, there are go, a lot no, of go ahead. No, go ahead, please. There are a lot of opportunities too with nonprofits, charities, and foundations. Right now, a lot of the budgets are are strained, and communications positions are usually one of the first to be eliminated in those organizations. So, right now, I suggest. I mean, if you have an interest whether it's the American Cancer Society or, you know, someone that has ALS or the Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, whatever organization it is, is you can reach out to their communications department and say, look, I have some free time. I have expertise in communications. I want to help. Can I build a portfolio or help you with a project? And then you can use that for future cases. And, and a lot of times, like, let's just say Nestle Perina, for instance, if you get an internship at Nestle Perina, odds are you're probably gonna get a job there. Um, you volunteer for an organization, when the economy turns around or there's a vaccine, there's odds are you're going to get offered a position there if, if you're eager and really passionate about moving forward and helping them out. So we've had a question from an ad major and the ad major wants to know in, in, um, uh, in Communic generally in communication, when is the narrowing your focus for career searching a good idea? I could see myself in multiple niches and the field can be so broad. So they're wondering, is it better to narrow your focus and interview for a specific area or should you cast your net wide? <laughs> uh, I will say I would definitely narrow it in because all of the fields are just very different in terms of what they are. So if you want to be a strategist versus, versus an account executive versus a copywriter, like there's so many different things you can do and they all require very different sets of skills. And so I would try to narrow it in as much as you can. So whether you want to be on the account side, great. There are different jobs you can pick within that. If you want to be on the digital side, look into those different careers and figure out what those jobs entail and see if any of that sparks your interest. Um, and same thing with copywriter, designer, whatever, if you wanna be in the creative field, um, you, you need to narrow it down because otherwise that when you're interviewing, we don't know where to place you either because we don't know <laughs> what you're gonna be happy in or what you can offer. We just are looking at a piece of paper or a book. And so you, you need to kind of help guide where you want your career to go um, and picking a niche is gonna help with that. 
Um, I would add on top of that too, a lot of the coursework that I did at Webster, um, I geared towards sports because I knew I wanted to work in sports. I specifically knew I wanted to work in baseball. Um, now I was hopeful that that was going to happen. I wasn't sure at the time that it was, um, and I got lucky that it did. But um, when I had to submit a crisis communication plan, I did a crisis communication plan for the Cardinals. You know, any piece of coursework that I had to do, I brought it back to sports. So, you know, a lot of college students say, well, I don't know how I can have this full portfolio whenever I've graduated. Well, if you gear all that coursework to towards a sector or an industry that you want to work in, then you do have that portfolio that you can then present to people when you go to job interviews. So um, all of my advertising work that I had to do, I always did surrounding sports. I always did all my, you know, communications plans. So that's probably the best advice I would give to narrow your search. So I had a question. Work, oh, go sorry, ahead. Jumping go ahead. In. For my work with Gary Sneese, I become an expert in the military veteran first responder space. And that's such a niche that I think a lot of people can actually become an expert in certain areas that there's not many others in that, that area. So at this point, I'm bidding out a project because of that expertise to, to actually live stream the 80th anniversary of Pearl Harbor next year in Hawaii. So if you become an expert and just specialize in a certain area, you'll be known as somebody to go to in that area, um, whether it's locally or nationally as well. I think in, in my in my little area of this conversation, it, it might be um, unwise to specialize. Um, it, you know, as far as if you want to be a baseball writer, and somebody offers you a job covering basketball, don't go. No, I'm going to be a baseball writer. Or if you want to be a sports writer, and somebody says, "Well, we have a features job open," go. Well, I'm no, I'm going to be. I'm I'm focused on being a sport because there are many different doors to walk through to ultimately get to one. I did not have a baseball writing job when I was first hired at my first newspaper. Um, but I always brought it up for how do I do that? And so while you may have a specialized interest, you know, like Sophie talked about, just definitely that, that is the great way to go about like just showing that you're proficient at your specialized interest. But in, you know, sports writing or journalism or newspaper writing, don't be closed off to other things because of my experience as a news writer on GA, my experience as a cops and courts writer helped me get a job later as a baseball writer. As odd as that sounds, it's true because I was able to do breaking news away from the field. I knew my way around the courts. I knew how to find um, police incident reports and that was necessary to then show them that I could handle the scope of any professional beat because one thing about being in sports and Sophie knows you mentioned this earlier is you kind of have to be ready to do everything and that's true when you're covering sports too is in one week I might cover a game but I also might cover you know a player being arrested I also might cover an owner trying to sell I also might cover season ticket prices going down or up um, I also might cover a Tommy John surgery so in the course of a week, I have to be an MD, a PhD, a business major, MBA, all these things. And you got to figure out, well, what you can't specialize and do that. You just have to maybe have one thoroughfare that you're good at, but know all the exit ramps to find information. Okay. We had a question from a student who is concerned about what industry, what communication industry is the easiest and the hardest for a communications new grad to get into. What area, what industries are the hardest and what industries are the easiest? From my perspective, I think crisis would be the hardest because you need a lot of experience in handling multiple crises. Um, it, it, you're gonna fail. I mean, as in your, sometime in your career, you're gonna fail and you're gonna fail miserably, but you learn from that and you build upon those failures or those missteps or, or, or whatever you did wrong, and you become better at presenting yourself and your client or your organization. So use every challenge or problem you run into as a learning experience. Okay. What transferable skills could be helpful in changing the career path uh, or uh, that you think it's never let too late to change after you have a job? Hmm. 
I think one, one just a great skill that I, so I had an internship in sales. I learned that I really do not enjoy sales at all, but I at least have those skills of presenting work and presenting myself. And it's, it has been a great skill to kind of have throughout all of my career. And so I think being able to present anything, not just yourself, but your work um, is a great skill to just kind of have throughout your entire life. So that's probably the one I can think of. Right along with that, I mean, the ability to be a public speaker. Yeah, the ability to be comfortable public. So you don't have to be a great order. You don't have to be William Jennings Bryan or Barack Obama to make it more current reference. Um, but to be a, com a, a comfortable talking publicly is so essential, especially as we go into the Zoom world um, or people. You know, I mean, every everybody seems to have a podcast now. So being able to do that is going to help you in any line of work, any any line of work because it's going to teach you partially leadership, how to be confident in what you say, um, and also how to sound like an expert with your tone, even if you're not an expert with your knowledge. Sophie, you were going to say something. Yeah, I definitely want to bounce back on what Angela said with um, sales. So after I graduated from Webster, I didn't get a job working in sports right off the bat. So I actually took a job at Best Buy in Brentwood selling appliances for eight months, I think. Um, and that might've been some of the most beneficial experience I had um, working just because I didn't know anything about selling a refrigerator or a washer and dryer, but I had to figure it out. And you know, once I figured it out and I had the confidence to actually sell these things, you figure out how you sell things and what works best for you. So I knew for me that I had to be knowledgeable about the product and had to at least think that the person I was selling it to needed that product to be able to sell it. Um, and so then when I transferred over to selling baseball tickets, I had to believe that people really wanted to come to the baseball game and that I thought it was a good product that was worth their money. Um, so, and, and if you're not, you know, as we've talked before about social anxiety around those things, Angela, I think did a great job of saying, Hey, maybe I can't like sell it to you in person, but I have this awesome Instagram page that has my product here. That's going to sell itself. So just kind of depends on what industry you're going to. Um, Angela has awesome artwork that she's going to sell that can be online. I have to be able to pick up a phone and sell baseball tickets. So I have to be able to sell myself with my words. So it just kind of depends on what your talents are. Okay. So so going a little further on what Sophia said, I, I think um, being a waiter for me in college and being able to interact with people and change subjects or deal with crises on turning on a dime really has helped me as a, a person to be able to handle uh, communication issues. And I think one of the other things I would suggest that uh, if you go into an agency or a firm um, or any organization, you're going to you're going to need to understand the business side of communications, whether it's sales or understand how your job is going to create an ROI for the organization. How are you going to pay for yourself? How are you going to help in a communication standpoint? Uh, better the organization from a business standpoint. So you two sports people there, here's a question. Do you have to be a sports fan in order to work in sports communications? How important is that? Um, I think fan is kind of a difficult word because I think if I was an extreme baseball fan, I couldn't actually do what I do in the sense of like, I geeked out every single time I saw a famous baseball player, I couldn't do what I do. Um, Cause I couldn't, you know, my general manager wouldn't trust me to interact with some of our baseball players. Um, but you do definitely need to be knowledgeable about the sport that you are working for. Um, when I interned with the blues, I was so thankful for that opportunity. Um, and I really met some awesome people and I got some awesome experience, but I was not knowledgeable about hockey. I grew up in the middle of Illinois. We did not watch hockey. My dad did not know anything about hockey we are like baseball and football and basketball people so I had to kind of quickly learn hockey and I think that made me realize okay I need to work in a sport where I'm very knowledgeable about how the actual sport works and for me that was baseball and football um, to piggyback what, off what Derek said take every opportunity you can um, obviously when I was offered the internship with the blues, did I say, no, I'm sorry, I don't want this internship because I don't know hockey. No, absolutely not. Um, do your research and learn as much as you can. But if you are going to work for a front office for a sports team, you definitely need to be knowledgeable about the sport. 
I am. Uh, I, this is something that comes up quite a bit. I get asked if I'm a Cardinal fan or if I grew up a Cardinal fan. I am not. Um, never was. Never have been. My my grandfather was a huge Cardinal fan, which I am much appreciate. I have a lot of appreciation for it because it gave me a sense of the history of the organization, and so I got to hear stories about him being a Cardinal fan from the '40s and Musial and all that stuff, which gave me an understanding that really does help me with my current job. Um, but the notion of so. There's something that they say in the press box. There's no cheering in the press box. Uh, it's just kind of a rule. Um, you don't, you're not there as the fan. You're there as an impartial observer in the same sense you would be if you were covering Congress or covering a city council meeting. Um, you know, the, this is something that is, is, brings a lot of pride to the press box, this notion of no cheering in the press box. However, however, it is important probably to be a fan of the sport. Um, I am, I am uh, very, uh, I'm a zealous advocate for baseball and I adore baseball and I love history and I like watching the games. I um, mean, I think this is important because if you're going to go into the journalism business or into the communications business, you are in some ways a, a guardian at the gate for that sport. And you can, you know, like keep it honest, keep, make sure that it, re it, it reflects the history. Here in St. Louis, baseball is a big deal. It's a public trust. And there needs to be people who hold the Cardinals accountable to their own brand, to their own history. And so I am not a fan of the Cardinals. However, I am a fan of baseball. And that also helps with the hours, as I'm sure Sophie knows. Um, you know, I'm, I don't know what time you get to the ballpark, but I'm sure it's seven or eight hours before a game starts. And then that game goes into the 12th inning and that runner is at second and not coming in. And you're there till 3 a.m. And if you don't have a fondness for the sport, if you're not a fan of the sport, then the hours really aren't going to be worth it. So great. Well, um, as we wrap up here, I would like to ask each of you to spend just a few minutes giving us some, um, some uh, encouraging words for the students and uh, some final advice that you might have. So let's start with Sophie. Yeah, um, so I would say my story really started with Webster and like the opportunities I got there. Um, the ex the internship and expo fair my junior year, they put out the list of who all was going to be there. And I saw Fox Sports Midwest and I just kind of went tunnel vision. I was like, I'm going to get that internship. That is mine. And then the day before the internship fair, we found out that like somebody was sick and Fox Sports Midwest wasn't gonna come. And I was devastated, um, but I still went to the internship fair. I still interned with, or I still talked to everybody that was there. And then the next day I went to Mindy who used to be our internship coordinator. And I said, I really wanted that Fox Sports Midwest internship. Can I please get in contact with somebody? So she gave me the contact information for um, the marketing director there who was supposed to come. I emailed him. I randomly got a call from an unknown number on like at 7 30 p.m. on a Friday and I just happened to answer it and it was the marketing director for Fox Sports Midwest and you know he gave me uh, an interview. I ended up they really didn't need an intern at that time but they said hey we've had good luck with students coming from Webster so we'll give you a shot. Um, so I kind of started off there. That led to my internship with the Blues because he knew the marketing director with the Blues. Um, so, and then I also participated in the mentorship program that Webster has, and they set me up with a Webster alum who worked for the San Antonio Spurs. Um, I ran everything past him, even the emails that I was sending out to random people, I would send him samples of it and have him check it and see what he thought. Um, and so he was a great resource for me. So all of that really started at Webster. Um, so I would just say, take advantage of every opportunity you can. Um, take if you're interested in sports take every sports class you can connect with every person from the university go through and read people who work in the front office of organizations you want to work for and if they graduated from Webster connect with them um, and that's a starting point so I would just say take advantage of every opportunity you can in the school um, to help you get where you are. Eric quick quick final thoughts. Oh good uh, yeah I'll try to be quick so uh, so the thought I have most just listen to what Sophie said is is always keep your kind of eyes on the horizon for what met, might be the next new thing um, you know just from my experience back in 04 when they put me on the baseball beat I asked you know is it something that I can write uh, for the web you know you know can we do something that's exclusive for the web um, the next year they had a word for that blog 
uh, 2008, I get an email saying, hey, there's this new Twitter thing. We want you to give it a try. So I gave it a try. Um, nine years ago, you know, I went to the paper and said, um, you know, we should do a podcast. We should do some kind of audio storytelling feature. And they said, sure, you can do it as long as you teach yourself how to do it. So I taught myself how to edit audio and I've taught myself how to edit video. And if you keep your eye on what might be the next new thing, you can stay ahead of the curve by building, being willing to earn it or uh, learn it um, and then, you know, just become more nimble with it. And I think uh, the words of encouragement that I would give is that there has probably never been a better time to be in this business because of all those outlets. You, you've heard all the descriptions from Sophie, from Angela, from Chris, you know, Instagram to show off your work. Um, when I was in your spot graduating, you wrote for a newspaper or you didn't. Now you can write for a newspaper, you can write for a website, you can write for a newsletter, you can start your own blog. You can do it. Um, you know, I might have been able to start a newsletter with 12 people in my family, but if I was gonna write, it was gonna be for a newspaper. Now it's never been better. And because of that, the competition means that everybody's stronger. And the basis of it all, if I can give one last piece of advice is get comfortable talking to people in groups it doesn't have to be you know you don't have to be a toastmaster as chris said but learn from toastmasters just learn to get comfortable talking um, because that is going to be the currency of the future it's the currency of it now angela quick final thoughts um i would definitely say make sure you get your book made today if you don't have one um i can't tell you how many times i've reviewed portfolios and somebody's getting ready to graduate in like a month or two and they don't even have a book um, your book is so important as a creative. I can't tell you, say that enough. Um, but also get it reviewed by professionals. Just send a quick email. Um, when you, if you're having a coffee or vi virtual coffee with somebody, see if they would be willing to sit down and kind of review your portfolio. It's, don't be afraid to continue to learn and improve your work. Um, cause it's going to show initiative. And if they suggest changing something, maybe follow up with them and show what you've actually done to improve your work from that. Um, I will also say know the why in whatever you're creating. Um, it's probably been my favorite piece of advice I've ever heard <laughs> for my career. Um, something can't just look pretty or sound cool. Um, you need to know why you made a specific design decision. You need to know why a consumer or somebody would even care about what you're making. So you need to understand that why. And then I would say, just don't let fear hold you back. Um, one of my favorite questions is what would you do if you weren't afraid? So do you, would you move cities? Would you apply to your dream job? Even though you thought it'd be impossible. Um, just taking chances, it might surprise you in a very <laughs> positive way. Um, and right now there's a ton to have fear about, but we just have to keep moving forward and just have faith that something else is gonna be better. And so you have to be able to willing, be willing to take that chance. Chris, final thoughts quickly. So I think um, careers are like chess is your goal is not only to plan for today and tomorrow, but, but what is, how do you win the game? What is your dream job? What would you love to do? And if you can't get that dream job today, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year, like what are the stepping stones to get to that point? Always keep learning, always take on new challenges. Um, really, encapsulate the thought process that you need to be that jack of all trades. You want to learn as much as you can and you want to volunteer for as much as you can and you want to get involved. I mean, the more eager you look uh, to an employer or when, when you're employed, I mean, you get more opportunities and that's just it is look to the future, but plan for today, but know that you might say no to a job um, because something else is on the horizon. Um, but you can always take that job and then move down the road. So you're not stuck to a job for six years or, or, or 20 years like we used to be. So, well, thank you all. Thanks to all the panel, Sophie, Derek, Angela, and Chris. We really appreciate your words of wisdom and thoughts for our students.